I'd like to introduce another one of our distinguished guests for Moody Women in Aviation Week 2021, retired Major General Margaret Woodward, who also goes by Maggie. Mm -hmm. She entered the Air Force in 1983 as a graduate of Arizona State University. Forks up, is that right? <laughs> there you go, good. <laughs> uh, she graduated with a degree in aerospace engineering and over her 31 year career in the Air Force, she spent almost 4,000 hours flying aerial refuelers and other aircraft. She was also the commander of 17th Air Force and US Air Forces Africa and served as the Coalition Forces Air Component Commander or CFAC for Operation Odyssey Dawn in Libya. And notably, she was also named by Time Magazine as one of the 100 most influential people in the world in 2011. So welcome, ma'am. I'm glad to have you. Thanks. And there you have that, right? Shows you how effective time is. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't find that in your bio. I had to Google it. <laughs> yeah, well, who wants to put that in their bio, right? <laughs> Oh, uh, well, I feel like I'm talking to a celebrity a little bit, so it's pretty cool. <laughs> Thanks, Jess. So I read that when you joined the Air Force, you already knew you wanted to be a pilot. Is that right? Yes, definitely. Um, in fact, I wanted to be a pilot uh, for as long as I could remember um, uh, before literally I could even remember. Um, my grandfather had uh, been one of the very first uh, military pilots, um, a Dedalian founder, and, uh, and he actually flew in World War I. Uh, so I'm sure he had a huge influence on me um, uh, because of that. Uh, and I literally didn't know that women couldn't fly in the Air Force. And I, I still remember my high school counselor uh, at one point, you know, as they do asking, well, okay, you know, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I'm going to be an Air Force pilot. And he looked at, looked into it and came back and said, you know, they don't let women fly. And, uh, <laughs> and I was so shocked. Um, and, uh, you know, just goes to show you how clueless I was at the time, but um, credit to my parents that they, listened to me all the time saying I wanted to be a pilot and never saying you can't do that. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, basically what I said to the counselor was exactly what I felt is that, well, you know, they're just going to have to change that because this is my destiny. I was that sure. Um, and, and being that sure helps, right? Because you just don't let anything get in your way when, when you know that that's what you have to do. Um, and I was just really lucky, the timing. Um, uh, at the time that I entered um, with my scholarship, they did not, um, they had women going through uh, uh, active duty women uh, in pilot training, but they weren't giving out pilot slots to anyone yet. So it was a little bit, I guess, of a risk, but I just knew it would happen. And in my sophomore year, they opened it up and I got a pilot slot. Uh, and I'm uh, very happy to, to be able to go to pilot training following uh, uh, college. So how did you know you wanted to join the Air Force? Was it because of your grandfather? Um, you know, it's just uh, something I always wanted to, uh, you know, thought that was the right thing, the best way to, to get to fly. Um, it was uh, really interesting that ultimately I ended up being able to command the 89th um, uh, airlift wing uh, at Andrews because one of the big influences for me is I, I think my brother and I both wanted to be astronauts early in the early days and um, and my father was uh, in the State Department we were living overseas uh, in fact in India in uh, at the time Bombay India and um, when the Apollo 11 astronauts went on their world tour and the crew of Air Force One that was flying them around the world um, stayed with us and um, actually came to a um, dinner at our house and, and uh, um, we got to spend the night with them, me and my brother, and tour the airplane. Uh, and we also got to meet the astronauts. But the astronauts, you have to understand, at the time, we're doing a world tour. We're very tired, exhausted, and, you know, a couple little kids, you know, were they were nice to us, but not very engaging. Um, whereas the crew of Air Force One, those guys were very engaging mm -hmm. and, uh, and really uh, um, captured me, I have to say. And, um, 
And I think that really turned my sights toward the Air Force. And slowly, um, what I you know learned is it was just took too long to become an astronaut, and and I have no patience. So <laughs> flying was much much more what I was interested in. Um, and it was kind of fun when I took over command of the uh, 89th Airlift Wing, which has which owns Air Force One. Uh, being able to tell them that you never know what kind of influence you're going to have, but you had a huge influence on this little girl. And, uh, and I think that's really true. That's awesome. Yes, that uh, justifies what we're trying to do here. Yep, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so throughout your career, who would you say has inspired you the most? Well, that's the easiest question I ever have to answer because that's my husband. Um, we met in ROTC and uh, um, uh, still married uh, 40, almost 40 years later. <laughs> um, and uh, it's just always been, I think I've spent my entire life just wanting to be as good as he is. And he's just been an excellent role model. He was two years ahead of me. So he always gave me the path and um, was just such a great mentor and honestly, the best role model I've ever had. So I just, I just want to be as good as him. I think one of the highest compliments I ever got was um, from a student that flew with both of us. And they said, you know, you, you and uh, the uh, other Lieutenant Woodward, you know, are so similar. And then later on, when we were both flight commanders, uh, some of our um, instructors who worked for us, you know, said similar thing. And, and that just made me feel really they thought it was very strange because our personalities are so different. I'm, I'm so out there and, and he was much quieter and uh, um, more mature. Um, and, uh, but when they said how similar we were, it just to me, that was the highest compliment in the world because I have so much respect for him. I love that story. I'm actually joint spouse too. My husband's two years oh. ahead of me. He's in the Great. Navy, but I feel the same way. But I do want to ask you, it's a challenge a lot of the time for joint spouse couples oh. to both stay in. Um, I know retention of women in the military is a big issue for family reasons a lot of the time. So how were you able to make that work with two really long, successful careers? Yeah, um, it's, it's certainly a, a huge challenge. I won't lie to you about that. Um, we were fairly lucky in the early days, of course, because um, he was two years ahead of me. We spent two years apart when he went to active duty and I was still in college. Um, and that, of course, was very difficult, um, especially at that early stage of your relationship. But um, he extended, you know, he made and honestly, my husband made the most sacrifices. You know, you both have to to try and stay together as best as you can. I will tell you that I think he made many more sacrifices than than I did for his career. Um, you know, for instance, he extended as a um, instructor pilot for a year, and then he wanted to go fly fighters, but there weren't any fighters. I only had a choice of four aircraft at the time I could go to heavy aircraft, and the only option for um, me that. And, and him where we could be together was for him to ask for fighter bombers, FB-111s with tankers. So he had to go to SAC instead of uh, at the time TAC um, uh, so that we could be stationed together. And he made that sacrifice for me. Um, uh, and then we actually went back to air training command to instruct again so that we could be together for our next assignment as SAC started to split up. Um, and everybody said, oh, you know, I, I remember having a squadron commander screaming at me literally in his office, you know, about you're throwing away a brilliant career, you know, going back to air training command. What are you doing? And I said, I really don't care. You know, I was a um, fairly young captain at the time and uh, said, you know, I just want to be with my husband and uh, turned out OK. Um, but uh, uh, so, you know, you have to make those sacrifices and assignments to try and stay together. You also um, have to accept, you know, a lot of time apart. Uh, we were, um, once we got back together there after, um, you know, getting our uh, assignments kind of synced up, once he made Colonel, though, at that point, um, at, uh, from that stage on, we were uh, apart 
uh, pretty much, I think in seven years, we were, um, for the next seven years after he made Colonel, we were together in the same house, I think for uh, um, a total of less than a year. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and so that was really challenging. Um, now we were lucky to have bosses that tried to work things. For instance, he was the wing commander at Del Rio and I was the ops group commander in uh, San Antonio. So, uh, you know, we were relatively close. And so we could, uh, you know, get together sometimes on weekends and things. So, um, you know, people, uh, if you do a really good job, I think for your bosses, they uh, tend to work really hard for you and try and help make things uh, come together. But you have to accept, um, that there are going to be separation and um uh we were lucky in that i you know honestly never really wanted to have children and i think if i had wanted to have kids um i think and and had kids i think it would have been much much more challenging um where one of us probably would have gotten out um to make that feasible um, we always expected that we'd have to get out at the four year point, um, which is your original commitment in those days for pilot training, because um, we wouldn't be able to stay together. And we just um, were able to keep getting assignments together and we both loved it so much that we just said, okay, well, we'll just keep going. We didn't accept the original bonus when it first came out for, for flyers because we wanted to have the option to, to get out. So you make a lot of um, choices at, along the way. Um, but I'll tell you in the end, you know, looking back, uh, you know, both of us think it's the best thing that ever happened to either one of us to be able to um, share two careers together side by side like we did. Um, absolutely love it and wouldn't trade it for the world. That was going to be my next question. <laughs> yeah, you know, I always feel funny um, when when people talk about regrets and this and that and it's just really interesting to, you know, have a career and a, and a, a life where both he and I, you know, sit there and sit, look back and go, gosh, you know, we don't feel like you have regrets. You know, there aren't, aren't things that we would change or, or wish should happen differently. And, and, you know, I think that's kind of the essence of a good life. And um, the Air Force has given that to both of us, which is pretty cool. So you talked about the challenges with the joint spouse. Would you say that was the biggest challenge you faced throughout your career or was it something else? Uh, you know, um, that's an interesting thing to talk about. Uh, I, I, there's always going to be significant challenges in any career. Um, but I would say, uh, before I talk about the challenges that I would weigh all the pluses against the challenges and say that the pluses so far outweigh all the challenges, you know, that, um, uh, I would, you know, never give it up, but, um, but certainly there's always going to be challenges. Um, the separation is one of them. Uh, for, for me, to be honest with you, there were times in the career where it was challenging being, um, and I, my whole life, you know, guys have always been my best friends and I, um, I have never had an issue fitting in, you know, with men. And of course, in my career, most of the time I've been either the only woman in the room or the squadron. Uh, uh, and, and that has never really bothered me, but there were certain times in my career where I felt um, alienated from some of my squadron mem members. Uh, a, a good example is when I was in Del Rio and they had just opened up pilot training to what we called uh, SUPT, right? Specialized undergraduate pilot training. And um, so in the T-38 squadron, it was all fighter pilots um, or bomber pilots, I think at the time. And, um, and I was already in the T-38 squadron and I had more hours in the T-38 than anybody else in the squadron because it was my second tour. Uh, and it was really difficult because you had a lot of these fighter pilots who uh, were like, well, a woman can't do, you know, what we do and didn't want to listen. And at the time I was the chief of check section that gave them all their check rides. And there was a, a lot of, um, uh, of an attitude that, you know, they were above a woman and, and didn't have to listen. Uh, and, and that 
honestly was, um, I mean, you see some of that as you're growing up in your whole life, but that was so concentrated at that time that it was very alienating and frustrating. I mean, to the point where uh, the commander of air training command asked me to fly with the new secretary of the air force, who was a female Dr. Widnall at the time. And I, when my uh, squadron commander asked me to go do that um, and I was gonna go fly her over in San Antonio. And I asked him not to tell my squadron mates because I knew that they would just treat me um, and you know, make fun of it. And, and it was just, you know, there were just times where it's just lonely and alienating um, to be uh, in that position. Uh, you know, and, and you just get through it and yeah, you know, having people like your husband who tells you, you know, that life is good and, and um, it gets you through those hard times, but there were, there were times where it was difficult being the out outlier. Was that early on? Yeah, that was pretty early. I was a captain at the time. Um, but I'll tell you, there were still times throughout your career where, um, there's a guys club sometimes, you know, that you don't fit into necessarily here or there. And, um, it, you know, it's, it's maybe somewhat a little bit alienating, but you just can't let it get to you. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I felt the same thing. I mean, that that's talking about being as the female, but honestly, when I was, a, uh, you know, I was a mobility pilot as a KC-135 um, uh, pilot. And when I was uh, commanding the uh, air war over Libya, as you mentioned, um, there was a, some frustration from the fighter pilots uh, who were my friends and colleagues who would love to be able to do that. And, um, and I think just a little bit of frustration and or jealousy that leads to some bad behavior, you know, and, you know, you just have to deal with that just like you do in everything else in life. Definitely. So I'm glad that my commander, who's the rescue group commander at Moody, uh, Colonel Russell Cook, he is the one who wanted to do this in the first place, this women in uh, aviation. Cool. So that we wanted to get more guys involved in this as well, like allies. So I yeah. think it's, it's great to show men out there who are as supportive of women as women are. So exactly. Yeah. And there's plenty of them out there. There really are. And, and times have, are changing and there's more and more all the time. So I think that, I think there's a lot of good out there. So what would you say is your most favorite memory throughout your career? <laughs> oh man, there are so many, um, you know, to pick just one is next to impossible. Um, I uh, absolutely loved doing the, um, uh, being the CFAC for Libya. Uh, that was just kind of like the culmination of everything that you've spent your career to, to prepare for. And uh, to be able to do that and to be with my, um, with all of these uh, foreign counterparts who came in and who just accepted me as JFAC, you know, after all the challenges, you know, you face, you know, your life trying to prove that you can be as good as the guys or, or this or that. And to have them come in from all these, uh, you know, we had 13 different countries uh, coming in, including, um, you know, several Arab states uh, and, uh, and just having them, um, be perfectly happy to accept you as as their leader and uh, and to accept your guidance and um, and to follow your lead. Uh, I thought that was uh, a pretty amazing thing. And then later on to be able to go to uh, Libya afterwards and have the uh, the new regime there um, host me, and that was quite a, an amazing experience to have. I mean, literally at one point at Gardabaya Air Airfield they had a line of young children with flowers that I had to walk between kind of like a gauntlet and they're throwing flowers at me. <laughs> I mean, you know, something you just never expect in, in any uh, lifetime budget career, but um, uh, just the appreciation they had for what we had done to support them. That was, that was pretty cool to see, even though they knew they had huge challenges ahead for, 
for another generation and they've been dealing with that ever since and but they knew they went into it knowing that um it would be a generation uh, that they would have to deal with you know difficulties before they could fix things for their kids but um i could probably give you a hundred million of them but that that's just the first one that comes to mind so for the young girls who may be watching this video what is a piece of advice you would give them if they want to do what you did hmm. well let me start by saying i think i love you know throughout my career i've always said quoted Mae West, which is a, an interesting person to quote for a military officer, I guess. But she said, if I can't be a, a good example, I can just be a horrible warning, you know? So <laughs> just don't do what I do, right? Um, it, you know, I think um, I think the biggest piece of advice that I like to, to give um, to up and coming um, officers, which would apply to the, the young women, I guess you're talking to, is don't be afraid to be yourself, to be different. Um, I think, especially in the military, sometimes we think that there's this push to make everybody the same, right? You know, we have this, you know, you got to conform, everybody has to look the same, everybody um, has to fit this mold. And, and sometimes we do that when we're teaching leadership courses, you know, we try to make it sound like, well, this is how you be a good leader, you know, and, and, and try and lay it out there as, as a, um, a prescription. Um, and I like to make sure that folks know that, you know, to be a good leader, that, that the most, the key ingredients into, into that are respect and trust. And nobody is going to respect you or trust you if you're not really honest and yourself, right? Um, and also the fact that the military and any organization needs diversity in order to be its full, um, to reach its full potential. So, um, you know, my key piece of advice is to, you know, be true to yourself. Um, don't be afraid of being different. That's what the organization needs. Um, and, uh, and when you're talking about younger folks who haven't even come in, I would say is don't let um, an organization that looks like it um, doesn't uh, accept diversity of thought or opinion or um, behavior, don't let that turn you off because it, it really isn't that way. And, and I think every day it's becoming more and more open and accepting, you know, just like you're talking about with your project here of um, wanting that diversity and, and needing it. And uh, um, I think that that's, uh, you know, it's a great opportunity, always has been, but even more so as time goes by for, for young women to, to come in and really find um, a career path that is uh, uh, not only fun and um, uh, you know, in, in so many ways uh, um, fulfilling, but also uh, where it, um, where you can contribute something that is so absolutely important that um, isn't necessarily there or other folks, you know, are not able to bring that to the table. Right. Well, I really appreciate your answers and you spending some time with us today oh sure thanks for asking jess i really appreciate it and i really really love what you guys are doing i think it's a wonderful wonderful very much needed uh initiative so thanks for taking it on absolutely ma'am okay